Let's pray. Father God, you have watched over us and you have blessed us since we last met and you have uh, encouraged us in our times of worship with your people. You have encouraged us in our families as we've loved and been loved by those that you've given us to spend our lives with. And Lord, we have so much to be grateful for, so much to thank you for. Most of all, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ whose forgiveness and mercy and grace is lavished upon us every day. Um, without one of those days being a day in which we deserve it. And Father God, we thank you for that. We thank you that you have chosen not to remember the sins of our youth. You, we thank you that you have chosen to separate our sins from us as far as the east is from the west and remember them no more. We thank you that we come before you as people who have been gifted by you and filled by your spirit and chosen uh, in your electing grace and and Father, your desire is to send us into this world and send us into your body with a ministry of encouragement and a ministry of blessing. And we ask, Father, that as we tonight consider uh, old age and um, the difficulties of old age from both a biblical perspective and from an understanding of life experience, Father, that you would continue to minister to our hearts and not only help us prepare for the inevitable, but help us also to be ones who minister to those among us who are elderly and frail and are at the, uh, the end of the human life cycle. So we pray you'd instruct us tonight and give us hearts that are full of wisdom. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Late adulthood. So we're up to uh, here in the uh, in eight stage development, and uh, uh, as uh, life expectancy is continuing to grow further and further, uh, we've we we find that in the literature that late adulthood is now having to be subdivided in order to account for increase of life expectancy. Uh, <coughs> So this, um, this stage of the lifespan is to be divided into young, old, 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 and oldest old. Uh, but we're going to deal with it simply as late adulthood. I've put that in there because you may come across those, that terminology in your reading. As the baby boomers age, uh, late adulthood is becoming a larger group in society, uh, with oldest old being mostly female. So the baby boomers are uh, right now coming into the young old category and um, those born immediately after the Second World War, they're coming into the young old and uh, up ahead of them is old old and oldest old. Uh, if you go into uh, rest homes where there are people of um, uh, from their 80s onwards, you'll find that uh, predominantly female. Uh, the men begin to die off in their 70s and women live on average another 10 years longer than men. Nobody knows quite why that is. There's plenty of antidotal suggestions, but in terms of scientific, it's, it's not known. Uh, that being the case, uh, you are able to calculate your life expectancy and you'll find there's a sheet there at the back of your notes to calculate your life expectancy and if you fill that out and answer those questions and add up your scores as it tells you to do on the back page you can come up with a pretty good idea of how long uh, you're likely to live. These are the kind of tables that are used by life insurance people and so on. Now uh, it's more than just a, a passing interest that I've included that. Uh, sometimes you'll find when you're counselling with people particularly people in late adulthood and they're very concerned about uh, uh, the way their life is going, they're con very concerned about death, they're very concerned about the uncertainty surrounding old age and particularly um, failing health. That sometimes it can be helpful to go through this exercise with them, a life expectancy exercise, and, and give them uh, uh, a little bit of a um, heads up as to uh, what they can count on. Um, so I'd encourage you to do that for your own interest. 
just to let your spouse know how long you'll be around. Uh, late adulthood is Ericsson's last life sp um, lifespan stage of integrity versus despair. That stage of life when a person looks back at the past and either concludes that he or she has made a contribution and has had a meaningful existence or that life has been meaningless. Uh, Erickson was not a Christian so for him old age did not carry the hope of a future glory. So for Erickson when you get to late adulthood all you can do is look back. There's nothing to look forward to except death so all you can do is look back and so his integrity versus despair is what you see when you stand at late adulthood and look back. Do you see evidence of a life lived that brings you to despair or does it bring you to the point of saying, hmm, my life has been of use, my life has been of value. Now from a Christian perspective, we can stand here and we can say, regardless of what's happened back there, we have something to look to up here which is glorious and life-giving. Uh, what is required for successful ageing? Secular research has come up with the following and again this is um, uh, this can be very helpful when you're counselling people in late adulthood. You may be asked to go into a rest home and do some counselling there with people that are in their 80s plus uh, and uh, or you might be uh, talking to people at this stage and you can include in your counselling some uh, uh, an awareness of what they can do you know to uh, improve the quality of their physical existence often when they get to here they're kind of given up they've given up their gym membership don't see too many people in the gym at this age so either they've given up on their bodies they've given up on uh, fitness and health and and there's things that uh, you can do maybe they've uh, maybe this is the time to quit smoking you see and and uh, rather than see it as um, something that's inevitable for the next 10 or 15 years. So for successful ageing, uh, physical health. Now while that seems a little obvious, uh, health concerns as you can imagine uh, become vital at this age and, and uh, as soon as a person in late adulthood loses their mobility, they age very, very quickly as soon as they can no longer get around uh, and that doesn't just mean losing their driver's license it also means the fact if they need um, they need a walker or something in order to move or a uh, uh, a motorized uh, wheelchair or um, a motorized scooter in other words they've lost their own mobility uh, there's a very quick drop off and degeneration in their in their ability to handle late adulthood mobility is so important. So physical health is important to maintain mobility for as many years as possible through into late adulthood. Uh, if you're in a church where there's a number of older people you'll be very aware that those that still have their mobility compared to those that haven't there's a there's a huge difference in uh, the pastoral need concerns of those two groups of people. Uh, retention of cognitive ability, um, keeping the mind active. Now as you come into late adulthood, uh, the mind remains uh, active long after the body begins to fade. It's not until you get into, into old old that uh, the mind begins to feel the effects of, uh, of age. Up until then, um, the mind is able to, uh, to study and to learn and to learn new things as much as it could back here and back here and so that's why occasionally you'll see reports of people of this age, particularly young old, who are going to university and graduating and the media makes a big thing of that because it's so unusual but it does bear out the point that the mind still remains active and, and study and uh, postgraduate study or study of any kind is still possible here which um, can be a very very uh, helpful activity for a late adult person to get involved in. <coughs> uh, marriage is uh, one of the keys for successful ageing. Uh, married people live longer, uh, they're more content, they tend to be better off financially and, uh, and able to deal with late adulthood because if they have a good marriage and to late adulthood you're not facing it alone, you've got somebody with you 
who over the years has proven themselves to be a good companion. So uh, for someone to go into late adulthood as a single person is far more difficult than as a married person. As a single person, they're facing all the challenges of aging uh, without the companionship and help of a spouse. Um, you see when we're back here, uh, people tend to back here and back here. Uh, divorce and marriage breakup isn't seen as being so hugely uh, tragic because, you know, there's still time to do it again. But by the time you get to here, not so easy to find a spouse. And, uh, and if you find a spouse at this age, then you haven't had a lifetime together and, and you get married here, say for a second or third time or whatever, and, you, and you'll be, you're having to develop a marriage relationship right in the midst of a significant deterioration in health and ability. So to, uh, <clears throat> if you're counselling a married couple and they're in this age bracket, um, uh, to help them with their marriage could be perhaps the most significant thing you can do to help them deal with late adulthood. Involvement in social and productive activities, uh, volunteer work and so on. Um, uh, faith, secular research has shown that people who have a faith commitment um, tend to uh, age successfully and people who have strong relationships especially with extended family and friends and with children and grandchildren. As you can appreciate this is uh, this can be a very lonely time for people who have not done a good job back here with developing and maintaining relationships with um, friends, close friends and family. Uh, that's the old story you know if you get to here and you haven't completed the tasks back here, the social tasks, then here's where you begin to feel the consequences of that and to, uh, uh, and to improve relationships here, you often have to go back and redo that task you failed to do back here in order to ensure that your relationships become strong. Now you can appreciate that in many cases when people get to late adulthood, uh, they've kind of given up. If these relationships have been bad for some time, they've given up, say, their relationships with their children or their adult children or even their grandchildren. And so uh, they will need the help of a counsellor, a pastoral counsellor perhaps, to begin to look at some of those relational issues, relational issues that uh, have been septic for a very long time and, and they don't really believe that anything can really be done about them. But as a counsellor, you understand, of course, that this transition this transition uh, can uh, be a crisis for people who are on their own. And so to help them repair relationships back here, particularly with family, uh, can become very necessary. Uh, common myths regarding the elderly. Uh, they are bad drivers. They can't learn new things. They don't enjoy sex. They are poor. They are always sick. Many people in late adulthood are really quite wealthy. They've planned for their retirement. They've got assets. They've got a mortgage-free house and got other assets, some of which you perhaps don't know about until after they've died. Um, and they're always sick. Unless they have a chronic illness, they're, they tend to be sick no more than in someone back in middle adulthood. If they've looked after themselves, they can be quite healthy. Common problems of the elderly. Now these are the common counselling issues that you'll face with people in late adulthood. The first one is social and family expectations. For instance, uh, uh, rest home care versus managing on their own. What are the family's expectations of the person in late adulthood? Uh, what are, the, uh, what are the, uh, the social or cultural expectations of a person in late adulthood? And what are the nuclear family's expectations? Uh, do, the, do the children expect their aged parents to go into a rest home or do they expect to take care of them themselves? What are the expectations? This, and uh, so when it comes to moving perhaps out of independent living into rest home living, uh, the decision then, which is often a decision made by the family, is should the 
late adulthood person go from independent living into care with the family or rest home care and you'll appreciate that different cultures have different attitudes to that um, again you go into rest homes even here in South Auckland of people in late adulthood and you'll find uh, very few marrying Polynesian in those rest homes they're all old people white people and female people Uh, so, now what often happens is a person gets to the point where they can no longer live on their own and that discussion has never taken place with their families, their nuclear families. Uh, perhaps they've been living on their own for a long time and their family is no longer in the city or maybe even in the country. They, they really have been dependent on perhaps church friends or neighbourhood friends for many, many years uh, living in home and now they have to go out of their home into a rest home and and, and that's a huge transition, right, from independent living, say, to rest home living. It can produce a crisis, and, and they're, they're, they're so dependent on their support systems that are in place. Now, those support systems may need uh, your involvement as a pastoral counsellor in order to ensure that those support systems actually work for that person. For instance, if someone's lived in a neighbourhood, on a street for many years, and then they, they disappear because they're going into a rest home, how many of the people in that street will actually go and visit them in the rest home? In other words, the, the people who they thought were their friends actually don't turn up at the rest home to visit them. Uh, they were happy to visit them while they were living next door to them. You see, that's a, that's a transition which can produce a crisis they weren't expecting. Uh, here's where uh, being part of a, a church community becomes very vital. Um, uh, late adulthood people in your church, uh, Sunday is probably... The only, perhaps for some of them, the only time on the week they actually get to talk to anyone and socialise. Uh, and so when they turn up at church, uh, they have great expectations for their own social engagement while they're there because they know that when church is over and they go back to their little house by themselves or they go back to the rest home, that's going to be it until next Sunday. So what are the family social and um, church expectations of people managing on their own. Uh, elder abuse. Elder abuse is a common problem suffered by the elderly and it's a problem which, elder abuse is a problem which doesn't surface readily, it's not always seen. Uh, research shows that three to five percent of elder abuse is mainly by spouses. Uh, we know like any kind of, any form of abuse really, whether abuse happens down here or at the other end, the abuse is more often than not by um, people known to the person, uh, family members or uh, members of the extended family. Um, again, uh, elder abuse usually happens when um, relationships have not been done well back here. And then now in late adulthood when the person is, is old and weak and dependent, they become very vulnerable to those who have perhaps nursed a bitterness against them for many years. And now they see this, their, this person has reached a point where, where that bitterness can be expressed without any danger of, of um, a violent or abusive reaction like there may have been in earlier years. And so sometimes what's been pent up for many years can suddenly display itself as elder abuse, whether it's in a marriage or whether it's in, um, you know, parents to children or uh, siblings. Um, uh, elder abuse is something which we should expect and look out for with, with older people, particularly if they're not well connected. Um, and we should ask questions around that. Um, uh, you know, how often do you see your children? How often do you see your um, your siblings? Maybe, maybe this person here has younger siblings that come to visit them. Um, how often do you see them? Oh well, you know, they came last week. Okay, well, how did that go? What what things did you talk about? Oh well, they're always asking for money. You see, and and so you begin to ask some more questions, and you find out, in fact, that perhaps this particular uh, child or sibling is putting pressure on them for money, to give them money. And um, 
So the elder abuse doesn't have, doesn't have to be uh, a physical, it can be um, putting pressure on them, obligation pressure, and uh, so you might have you might have mum in the rest home, and mum might have uh, three or four adult children, and uh, among those adult children there was one who has been perhaps a very dependent person, perhaps they've been dependent on substance abuse, or perhaps they've had a life in which things haven't worked out for them, and now they see their mother in a vulnerable position, and so they're coming to see the mother and asking the mother for money, and, and the other siblings see this happening, and they're upset with the mother for giving in to this, to their sibling, and, and very soon things can escalate, where things seem peaceful, suddenly there's, um, <clears throat> there's transition and crisis. Uh, depression and anxiety are very common problems of the elderly. You can appreciate that uh, they're coming into a, a situation where there's not a lot of hope left, humanly speaking, for their life. They've pretty much lived their life and they're just, you know, waiting for the end. Um, and so as they look back, they can, Erickson's despair can set in. Uh, loss of dominion, both physical and mental. Um, this is where uh, other people take over their lives. Adult children might take over, for instance, and start making decisions for them. Um, I remember a conversation that my children had about a couple of years ago, and uh, they had it in our presence, and they were just kind of talking among themselves about, you know, what's going to happen if Dad goes first, or what's going to happen if Mum goes first? Who's going to look after them? And uh, Margaret and I were sitting there thinking, well, this is interesting. <laughs> you know, having this conversation, and, and one of them said, oh, well, if mum goes first, I'll look after dad, and the other one said, well, yeah, well, oh, I don't want him, you can have him, <laughs> you see? Another one said, well, if dad goes first, I'll look after mum, oh, no, I want to look after mum, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, <laughs> well, that's fine, you know, we can laugh about it now, but see, if, if mum and dad are right here, and that conversation is going on, it can be a very scary time, you see, and, but already, you see, they're, they're choosing up sides. And, uh, and, and I'm sitting there and I'm saying to Margaret, um, I might not want to go with any of them. See, I might rather just live on my own and go and live with them. We well, see this is a dominion issue. Are, are they taking over? Are they making decisions on my behalf? Has it started already? I mean, I'm only here. I'm only here. I've got all of that maybe, you see. And uh, that becomes a very real issue, particularly for... Um, uh, people who have um, been fiercely independent all their lives and suddenly they find that dominion is gone. Not only are the children making decisions, but the people who run the rest home are making decisions. You have to eat at a certain time. This is what you have to eat. This is your regulation, uh, regulated life. Um, rest home care. And, uh, and the person feels so totally powerless. Um, they may even have had the control of their finances taken out of their hands. Maybe they're not driving anymore. They feel totally powerless. And, and, and they've never felt like this their whole life long regarding these issues. They've always been able to have some kind of dominion, control over their lives. And, and so what do they do in the face of that? Well, uh, it's no use getting angry about it because the situation is what it is. And, and you can get angry and rail and perhaps, you know, back here, they, that's how they lived their lives. They just got angry when things weren't going their way. But now, when you're in the rest home and you get angry, well, what are they going to do? Lock in your room and stop feeding you? I mean, you're so dependent on them for everything. And so what often happens is they tend to go the other way and they revert to childhood and, and they kind of um, either give in to the dependence and revert to childhood or they, uh, they play up to the dependence. And, be, and become even more dependent and refuse to try and do anything. Um, it's a way of uh, exercising some kind of dominion or uh, impact on your environment. So if you're, uh, if you're counselling someone who's in late adulthood and they're experiencing loss of dominion, you'll find that that's the thing they'll complain, again, uh, complain about the most. Uh, loneliness. You know, they never bring the grandchildren to visit me. Now, see, it doesn't matter how many times they bring the grandchildren to visit, it's never enough. Because in between the visits, the loneliness sets in. 
You see, the only way to deal with the loneliness is for the grandchildren to be there 24-7. Well, that's not going to happen. Not unless you're living with the grandchildren. So there's, uh, there's real loneliness. Now, you see, back here, when they were somewhat independent, they could deal with the loneliness themselves on their own terms. They could ring someone up. They could go and visit someone. They can invite someone over for coffee. Not so easy back here when you're uh, down here when you're so dependent on others. Uh, bitterness over the way life's turned out. Uh, regret, um, regret over uh, perhaps shame and regret over the way they've acted themselves. Uh, dementia, which is uh, a, um, a disease of the brain. Uh, bodily diseases generally. And of course, death is a common problem of the elderly. Elderly people tend to die at a far higher rate than anyone else in the lifespan. Okay, uh, before we look at the biblical perspective on ageing, is there anything that uh, what I've said thus far has, has sparked any thoughts or any impressions for you about late adulthood? example to younger guys and say you guys you don't want to end up like that and they really see it it's quite powerful yeah. <coughs> quite sad we still got a sense of humor <laughs> as you think about some of the late adults in your own church community for instance um, uh, what does some of this information tell you about about them and the way you might relate to them? You should be a bit more willing to notice them on Sunday and just spend a few minutes talking to them. Especially the single one. To take a few minutes to talk to them would be uh, like giving them a drink from the fountain of youth. Mm. See, it'll just it'll make that much difference to them. Perhaps if you've got young children, you know, you just uh, young children tend to be a bit scared of old people. Um, but if you've got your kids there and you're talking to this older person, you just kind of hold on to your child and just you know introduce them to the older person and. You see what you're doing? You're, you're, you're connecting late adulthood with early childhood. See? And, and suddenly, suddenly they are connected with life again. See? Here they've, they're done with life. But you have the opportunity to connect them with life. Those things that will invigorate and encourage and bless them. If you think about your own parents and coming into late adulthood, what's come of th what sort of thoughts come to mind there? Mm, I kind of thought my siblings and me would never put them in an old folks home, but. 
now myself I still can't think of doing that but then I think well just from watching other families and you think oh yeah they look after them whatever but they don't they always you know they want to carry on the track they're on with all the stuff they do so that does not going to work so put your parents in the home they might visit them a lot and all that but so I sort of wonder we I haven't talked to my siblings about that um, my parents are still really active. So. Yeah. I certainly never ever had the image of them in a the home. So. Yeah. As you think about <clears throat> your own parents, and as you think about some of the late adults you know in your church, what would you anticipate some of the uh, the, the counselling issues to be that they might encounter? What crises might they face with the transition to late adulthood? The term generativity, when they used to, some of their, their, whole, their whole life has been serving or giving or, or doing or something, and then, and then having to basically year by year drop more and more activity and they feel like they are not used to anyone anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. My grandfather lived with us for a while before he died and he had retired early and was really active in his church and counseling couples and an elder and um, he had a lot of anxiety later in life and doubting his salvation and um, yeah he was really used to helping people and I think having to be dependent and losing control was really really hard for him. Okay, even brought on a crisis of faith. Mm. Okay. I agree that that mobility issue is a, is a huge one um, and often it's to do with confidence are afraid they might, or they've had one fall and they, it just puts them in shock and then they, they don't want to go out by themselves right. anymore. Right. But it, it just makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. uh, just coming back to Mark's earlier point about, um, uh, you know, they've lived an active life, for instance, and now they're in late adulthood and perhaps. Uh, uh, they're not able to go out and find things to do and so we have to find things for them to do so make little opportunities at church for instance for them to serve in some way uh, put them on a roster don't just assume because they're because they're here that they can't be on rosters anymore you see they, it's easier to overlook them That's where the modern world in it, focusing on efficiency and time efficiency is kind of, it's not really an effective way of ministering to people because, yeah, they might take longer to do it, say, if they're going around collecting their cups or something, twice as long, but it's still actually, long term, it's still actually more effect, efficient, really, because they'll need less care and they'll have a better sense of. They'll age, the age, right. they'll age more successfully. opportunities to serve, they almost need to be part of a, a team or they need to have a support person so that if they are feeling sick or whatever one week they're not feeling bad or obliged right. um, to, to, do, to do that activity that they, they are they are able to use their time but they're also able to um, step back when they need to. Okay, very good. So you might have a uh, you might have some people roster on for morning tea every Sunday morning, and uh, one of the people on that roster might be an older person, and and so the people on that team uh, have to make space for her and allow her it's usually a her to um, you know do some things there and they might move at a slower pace and they might you know spill the tea or 
you know, they might end up talking to somebody and, you know, we can't get impatient with them because he's the one of, one of Christ's little lambs, which he treasures, and very soon he's going to take them home to himself. And, and we have the privilege of, of loving them just for this period of time. I don't know how long it is. Well, we've got them. So we make, we make room for them in the kitchen and, and let them, uh, you know, and, and you know, you're looking at your watch and thinking you want to go home and this person is still emptying the cup out and trying to wash it and dry it and try to be useful and put it away and you could do it in half the time. person doing um, everything like they used to, but potentially if they can connect to different uh, ages, including maybe adolescence and early childhood, and in some way even to be able to encourage even leaders for that sort of age group or, or, or something, uh, there's, there's different ways that they can be hugely beneficial. That brings up a good point, doesn't it? That that if they have um, if they've found ways to serve back here, found ways of using their gifts and, and so on, then as, as they go into late adulthood, they can continue to do that, uh, but in a less active capacity. Whereas um, if they haven't been doing that back here, they come into here, it's pretty hard to start from scratch here and, and, uh, and move them into some kind of ministry or service. Um, Again, you know, it's that uh, generativity idea that if, if those tasks haven't been done back here, then they won't be available for them here quite so easily. So it's a real challenge for us as um, children of ageing parents or as people serving in church to look for opportunities to help the late adulthood serve and feel like they're making a contribution. Are they bad drivers, or do they just drive more slowly? Because their reflexes aren't as quick. So they tend to drive more slowly. Okay. What was, what was your experience of your grandparents? Uh, it may have been, um, you may have experienced them when you were back here somewhere, but what are your experiences, what are your memories of your grandparents? Uh, looking at, for instance, common problems of the elderly, or uh, common myths of the elderly, anything in there kind of uh, jog your memory about your own grandparents? Things that you remember observing or thinking about? Okay, three out of the four, okay, it's pretty good. And then one on each dad's my grandfather, dad's dad and mum's mum, they lived into their 90s, basically died at home. They had a, a fall, both of them, in a few years before that, but they bounced back pretty well actually. Walking around, yeah. They're living, on, really look, sick they're living on their own. Yeah. Oh, okay. granddad was with his oldest daughters have never married. But yeah, grandma was tough as nails, man. Right? Uh, gardening, and, yeah, had a little scooter in the end, drove a car until she was 80. Granny was driving a truck when he was 80, around the farm and everything. He was strong until just before he died, was he? Even when he was 93 when he died, like, he could crush your hand, like. Just all that manual labour, he huge hands. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And he was sharp. They were all both sharp as a tack. So how old were you when they died? Uh, I think it was 20. Okay. 
So did you, um, those common problems, the elderly tended to, to bypass them because they were fit and active and independent and... Okay. Oh no, they had a few troubles, but more with like eyesight and um, hearing a little bit. But in terms of their cognitive mm -hmm. and, uh, and understanding, they were good. Um, well, hearing tends to go first, doesn't it? And eyesight tends to go last. They'll stop hearing before they stop seeing, unless there's some disease like a macular degeneration or something. Well, let's look at a biblical perspective on ageing. Uh, sickness and death are a result of the fall. So, uh, see, um, Back here, well, pain and childbirth is a reminder of the fall at this end. Old age and death is a reminder of the fall at this end. But in between, there's not too many reminders of the fall, unless there's uh, sickness and death at a premature age. But generally speaking, we can get through childhood, adolescent, early adulthood, middle adulthood, if we're in good health and we've got good friends and a strong faith. There's not a lot of evidence of the fall having actually affected us bodily. But when we get into late adulthood, then it becomes a uh, fall, if you like, catches up with us, or, or it begins to overwhelm us and overtake us. And now it begins to show its effect as our body begins to slow down and uh, become prone to sickness. So as a result of the fall, not only did death come, but... Um, a sickness and a gradually a gradual shortening of the lifespans. Death comes into the world with the fall and lifespans are shortened in order to limit and restrain sinful behaviour. Uh, let's just look at a few verses here. Genesis 2 7. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. It's 2.17, uh, 3.19. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you are taken for dust you are and dust you shall return. So having been formed from the dust of the ground man and his physical body will return to dust. Now, you see in 2.7, that's a reference to man's physical body. It was formed from the dust, and his, his life came from the breath of life that was breathed into his physical body, and he became a living being, a being when his physical body, which was made from the dust, was joined with the life-giving breath of God. Now, in, three, uh, <coughs> in 3.19, the reverse happens, and the life-giving breath is removed, and so this body of dust falls over and goes back to dust as a result of the fall. Uh, five five. Altogether, Adam lived nine hundred and thirty years, and then he died. Uh, <clears throat> Psalm ninety, verse seven. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indig in indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but, but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Now that... that prayer was written by Moses when he was an old man. So this is an old man looking back over his life. Our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Now, here we are. Here's the moan. But you see, the moan begins before there. The moan begins back here. 
and the moan gets louder and louder and louder and louder until death. We finish our years with a moan. Uh, the length of our days is 70 years, or 80 if we have strength. And yet in Genesis 5, verse 5, altogether Adam lived 930 years and then he died. The phrase, and then he died, as God said to him, if you eat of the fruit of this tree, you will surely die. He lived 930 years and then he died. He died because of the fall, but he lived 930 years. By the time you get to Moses, the lifespan is shortened down to 70, maybe 80. 70 down to 80, and here somewhere, medical science has pushed it out here. For those of us who are fortunate enough to live in the Western world, it's pushed it out here. You see how lifespans have been shortened dramatically. Noah fathered children when he was 500 years old. Uh, Genesis 5. Genesis 5.32. After Noah was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So at 500 years of age, he was still having children. Yet by the time you get to Abraham, he could not father a child naturally at the age of 99 or 100. Uh, Genesis 17, verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. And uh, verse 17. Abraham fell face down and laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? It's considered an impossibility. So uh, the birth of Isaac had to be a miraculous birth because Abraham and Sarah were both past the age where they could have children uh, of their own device. So he's Noah at 500 years, able to have children. By the time you get to Abraham, not able to procreate at 99, 100. So you see there's a, there's a shortening of the lifespan in order to limit and restrain sinful behavior. Why would God want a creature given over to sin to live any time at all? The fact they lived to 70 years is indeed a measure of God's grace to them which they do not deserve. And by restricting lifespans, of course, God, by thereby restricting sinful behavior, uh, then is... Um, um, providing for his common grace opportunity for the church to flourish and, and uh, proclaim the gospel and, and grow and develop because we're not having to put up with sinful people for 500 years. Now, you think of someone that you know who's been particularly mean and horrible to you and, and if, imagine if you had to put up with that for 500 years. Imagine if you had to put up with your parents for 500 years. You see, it's of the Lord's mercies, isn't it? that lifespans are shortened. Well, really from, the, from Genesis 3 on, the scriptures are very realistic about the difficulties of old age because the scriptures are very realistic about the fall into sin and the, uh, the effect on human life. Just look at a few of these scriptures here. And, and these are scriptures that are very useful to share with someone if you're counselling someone in late adulthood and they're wondering why, why God has allowed them to become ill and infirm and, and old and, and, and uh, you know, they feel like God's forgotten about them. Everyone's forgotten about them, even God, because they're just kind of just wasting away, as it were. Well, God is very aware of what's happening to them in um, late adulthood. So Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 1. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, in the, years of, in the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. There's a description of someone in late adulthood. Uh, there are days of trouble in which no pleasure is found. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain, when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop. 
When the grinders cease because they are few and those looking through the windows are dim. When the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding, grind, uh, grinding fades. You see, these are all descriptions of a person who's... Uh, whose age is caught up with them and they're unable to do all the normal routine things of life. When men rise up at the sounds of birds but their songs grow faint. When men are afraid of heights and of dangers in the street. Afraid of falling over perhaps. When the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along and desire no longer is stirred. Then man goes to his eternal home and mourners go about the street. So what at the end of verse 5 is death and uh, uh, and, and all those verses between 1 and 5 is a description of what old age is like as we approach the time of death. Remember him, remember God, before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken. It's a reference to death. Before the pitcher is shattered at the spring or the wheel broken at the well. For the dust returns to the ground from where it came and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, everything is meaningless and for indeed uh, someone in old age that could well be their cry. Verse 13 of that chapter, now all has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man for God will bring every deed into judgment including every hidden thing whether it's good or evil. Now you see in that chapter the writer starts out describing old age and what it's like and then at the very last couple of verses he gives us a perspective beyond death. There is something beyond death that we can hope for. So uh, fear God and keep his commandments so that beyond death there might be um, a good thing awaiting you. The days are coming when there will be a loss of vision and strength and all that matters is your relationship with God. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. In other words, here at this stage of your life your relationship with God becomes not only vital, but really the only thing that matters now. You're just about to go and meet him. This is a good time to look to your relationship to him. And so in your pastoral counselling with someone in late adulthood, you're talking to them about their relationship with God. Now, of course, you're doing that at all these stages. Uh, but here it becomes vital because death is coming. <coughs> uh, Let's go back to Psalm 90 again. Again, this is Moses, an old man, reminiscing. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years on your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like the watch in a night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. Uh, verse 13, Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Now there's, um, there's Moses' perspective on Erickson. You see, as Moses is an old man, perhaps um, he, was, he was over 100 when he died, wasn't he? So he's, he's way up here and he's looking back on his life. He's asking that the Lord will establish the work of his hands. In other words, uh, let me see that there's been some generativity that will survive me after I've gone. This is, this is the concern of an old man when he dies, that he'll leave behind a legacy that will survive him. Um, make, make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. And here's someone at this end of their life, seeing the whole of their lifespan in terms of the trouble and struggle of living life in a fallen world. Now, you see, the Bible is very realistic. These are the things that people in late adulthood are struggling about, things they're thinking about, things that occupy their thoughts, things that occupy their relationship with God and their devotional life with God. They're thinking about what's gone past. And, and, and they're making that part of their communication with God like Moses is. As, as Moses is... Uh, 
praying to God and, and seeking to be reconciled himself with, with the life that he's lived before God. So it's probably not the kind of psalm you'd want to use as a call to worship on Sunday morning, but it is a wonderful psalm to use with the elderly. There's so much in here that they can identify with. This is his perspective as he looks back. This is his testimony to his descendants. As he ages, he clings closer to God and looks to the Lord to vindicate his life efforts. Uh, Psalm 71. Verse 9. Do not cast me away when I am old. Do not forsake me when my strength is gone. The effects of the fall are beginning to close in. When youthful strength and vitality were present, the effects of the fall seemed far away. Now they are close at hand. Do not cast me away when I am old. Do not forsake me when my strength is gone. Uh, Isaiah 27. Uh, sorry, Genesis 27. Verse 1, when Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for his son Esau. So uh, Isaac is bedridden and blind. And he's dependent on his son to go and get the food for his, daily, for his midday meal. See, here's the reality of the fall. Isaac is living the reality of the fall. And in that state of dependence and weakness, his family take advantage of him. His wife and his younger son scheme to deceive him. Now, the old man is totally helpless. He's blind. He's bedridden. He's dependent on his wife to care for him. He's dependent on his son to feed him. And in that state of vulnerability, he is deceived and cheated and taken advantage of. Now, in, in, in a modern 21st century context, uh, they would um, uh, rob him of his life savings, or they'd empty out his, out his bank account. Basically, the only wealth that Isaac had left was the wealth to pass on to his firstborn. And, and uh, Jacob robbed him of that wealth, robbed him of his legacy. <coughs> Um, we see a similar thing in uh, John, John 21. Verse 18. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. When you're younger, you dress yourself. They can't even dress themselves. Um, in their frailty, they will reach out their hand for, for, for someone to, to take their hand and, and, and hold them up. Strengthen them, something they can clasp onto, and their frailty and their shakiness, you know, they're, they're, they're grasping for your arm or your hand to hold on to you so they feel a little bit more secure as they, as they totter along. And, and, and a person in that state, of course, has very little control over where that person they're leading on takes them. You see how realistic the scriptures are about the frailty of old age and the, the effects of the sin as it works itself out in our bodies. Verses and is actually talking about something else, isn't it? Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Verse. I think verse 19 it says, This he spoke signifying what death he would glorify God. So it's a description of him in his old age. 
when he'll be led to his death. So it's not being stretched out in, in other ways. So you know, I guess he's talking to, to Peter, and we know that Peter was crucified. Is that correct? We don't know that. We assume it. Um, uh, from that passage, from verse I read out, Jesus is saying, "When Peter is old and his strength is gone, uh, he'll be led to, in a way that he wouldn't have chosen to go. He'll be led to martyrdom." And why does it say, signifying by what death he would glorify God, not signifying by the life he would lead before he died? You were. The death he would die would be a death in which he was led to in his frailty and old age. The rest doesn't tell us how he died. It tells us some of the circumstances around his death. But either way, it's a description of someone in their old age and their frailty and their vulnerability. So I'm using it to illustrate that. Um, however, the scriptures are also full of promise, glory, honour, wisdom, dignity and respect that comes with old age. So here's the other side of the story. The scriptures are very realistic, presenting uh, old age in all its stark reality, but there also is another perspective on old age which we can't afford to lose sight of, particularly if we're involved in counselling with people. In late adulthood, Leviticus 19, verse 32. Rise in the presence of the aged, show respect for the elderly, and revere your God, for I am the Lord. Now, in, um, in your own uh, uh, counselling relationship with people in late adulthood, or in your own relationships generally with people of late adulthood, to uh, show them respect and honour is to, is to revere the Lord. The Lord reveres the elderly, and for us to revere the elderly is to revere God. Uh, Joshua, chapter 14. Verse 10. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the desert. So here today... I'm 85 years old, I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Uh, so here's a perspective on old age. Still strong and vigorous at 85 and looking for more that he could do for the Lord. Sounds a bit like uh, Andrew's grandfather. At 85, still strong and vigorous, but in Caleb's case, at 85, he's still looking for more that he can do to serve God. And, uh, and so if, if, we have, if we have 85s in our midst who are strong and vital and who love the Lord and are looking for ways to serve God, then, then we should certainly do all we can to provide that, just as Joshua was called on to provide that. Uh, 1 Chronicles 29. 26. David, son of Jesse, was king over all Israel. He ruled over Israel 40 years, 7 in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. He died at a good old age, having enjoyed long life, wealth, and honor. His son Solomon succeeded him as king. Uh, so here uh, we have this perspective on David, that death in old age for David was a cause to celebrate a life of honor with a son to succeed him. So he died at a good old age, having enjoyed a long life, wealth, and honor. So he could look back here on a long life well lived, with wealth and honour and a son to succeed him. That's someone who has aged well. Uh, 
uh, Psalm 92. Verse 12. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock. There is no wickedness in him. Here's a beautiful picture of old age leaning on the Lord, flourishing like a palm tree planted in the house of the Lord, bearing fruit in old age, staying fresh and green, with, with a testimony to the goodness of God. So, you know, here they are, still serving God, still enjoying their life with God and their relationship with God, and in spite of the frailty of the body, still proclaiming the goodness of God and the righteousness of God. I mean, do you know any old people like that? Who just... Uh, uh, when you're with them, it's, it's like being in the presence of someone who just walks daily with the Lord. And with their joy and their positive attitude and their commitment to God and their commitment to the goodness of God on a daily basis. And they're just a joy to be around. So different from an old person who's always complaining and grumpy all the time. Well, which kind of old person do you want to be? Which kind of old person do I want to be? Well, if that's where I want to end up, then we need to start doing the things now that will ensure the direction of our life. And in a counselling situation, you see you're, you're counselling somebody here so that as they get down here, they can have this kind of a testimony. A Psalm 92 testimony. Uh, Hebrews 11. Verse 21. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. Uh, even old age and infirmity can be a time of worship. Uh, <clears throat> as he was dying, leaning on top of his staff, and firm, close to death, he was still able to leave his sons a blessing. Um, rather than leaving them a curse, he left them a blessing. And he left them a blessing because the infirmity of old age did not dim his heart. See, the heart does not grow old. The heart does not grow infirm. The body grows old and infirm, but not the heart. The heart can still remain as young and as vital and as excited and full of joy in their relationship with God as it always has. As the outward wastes away, the inward is renewed daily. And so here we have this beautiful picture of Jacob with, with an old body and a young heart. An old body that was infirm and leaning on a staff for support and yet a heart that was full of worship and blessing to leave to his sons. John 14. Verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I am going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. Here's a promise from a faithful God on which the elderly can rely. And finally, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But God... Has indeed been raised, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. In verse 42 of the same chapter. <clears throat> so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written... 
The first man, Adam, became a live, a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as the man is... As, and as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have been born, as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so we shall bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Uh, <clears throat> Verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Here is the sure hope of following Christ's resurrection, removing the sting from old age, frailty and death. We cannot escape the consequences of the fall. The presence of the elderly among us provides a powerful testimony to this bodily reality. As you see old people and interact with old people, let their very presence remind you of the truth of the fall and of the necessity of salvation in Christ. You are seeing the curse being acted out in front of your very eyes in this very physical drama of an elderly person in their frailty. You are seeing the, the effects of Adam's fall being lived out in front of you, and it's a wonderful reminder and testimony to you that our only hope is gospel promise. Yet there's another testimony, a testimony of the heart. While one is perishing, the other is exulting in the coming glory. Um, the heart does not grow old and infirm. Second Corinthians 4.16 Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporal, but what is unseen is eternal. And so for a person late adulthood, See, they're fixing their eyes on what is unseen up here rather than what is seen, which is the frailty of their bodies slowly deteriorating. Okay, well, we should take a break. What, I, what I'd like to do now is um, just change, change tr uh, tack a little bit. Uh, I just want to read a couple of verses to you and then uh, talk a bit more about them. 2 Corinthians uh, 5.17 I probably should hand this out first. Uh, in, in looking at all this age stage development from a counselling point of view, we've found ourselves wrestling with the idea that what happens in one stage influences what happens in subsequent stages. And if you, if you have a counselling issue in, in one stage, you often have to go back and deal with unfinished tasks in previous stages. Now, a lot of Christians have a problem with that. And they'll ask you this question, why are you asking me questions about my past? And the question will be based basically on these two verses. So I'll just read them out to you, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So why are you asking me questions about my past? The old has gone and the new has come. I am a new creation in Christ. Why are you asking me questions about my past, particularly my past say, before Christ, if you had a testimony um, of uh, conversion. The other one is Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize which Christ has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Forgetting what is behind, I press on to win the goal which surely which is available to me in death, prize in Christ Jesus. So that being the case then, why are you asking me questions about my past? 
So what I've done is I've written this uh, paper to answer that question. And it uh, seems rather a long paper, doesn't it? To answer a simple question. But we'll give it a go and see how far we get. Anyone who is involved in offering spiritual direction and counselling within the Christian community may well find themselves having to do business with the biblical texts that we've just read. Someone comes to you who gives voice to a struggle, a doubt, a fear, any issue in their lives that is causing them concern. Questions are often asked by you, the careful listener, with a view to understanding that person's personal circumstance and wider life situation. In the process of this questioning, information may be sought regarding past experiences perhaps from childhood, that may have a bearing on the present day difficulty. It is at this point the objection is often raised. Why are you asking me questions about my past? I have been made a new person in Jesus Christ, so there is no need to delve into these past issues. I have to forget what lies behind me and just press forward. Recourse is often made to the two texts mentioned above, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Philippians 3, 13, when this kind of objection is raised. I propose to take each of these two texts in turn and consider their meaning in the light of this objection. To do so, I wish first to consider the context in which these texts are found, namely the theology and writing of the Apostle Paul. You'll appreciate that both these texts, Corinthians and Philippians, are both written by the Apostle Paul. So what's the context of these writings? Pauline theology. Each human writer of scripture wrote within their own historical context, frame of reference and particular circumstance. This largely accounts for the diversity of the biblical writings. Yet each human writer also wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, reflecting the intentions of the divine author. This accounts for the unity of the biblical writings. The fact there's one divine author accounts for the unity of the biblical writings. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that followed. So here we find even the Old Testament writers were indwelt with the same Spirit of Christ that we have indwelling us, hence bringing a unity to what was written in both Old and New Testaments. So within the diversity of, say, the New Testament, it is possible to speak of the theology of Peter, the theology of Paul or John, without losing the overall unity intended by the one divine author. Both the texts being considered in this paper were written by Paul and reflect his theological perspective. What was that perspective? In his writings, Paul picks up and develops or unpacks the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels regarding the two ages in which we now live, this present age and the age to come. And we probably don't have time to look up all these verses. That will be something that you can do when you find yourself with an hour with nothing to do. In Matthew 12, Jesus speaks of this age and the age to come as the two ages which account for all of history, past, present and future. In Luke 20, Jesus applies this two age concept to the marriage state, while in Mark 10 he applies it to the present and future gospel blessings. In the Gospels, this age to come is often referred to by Jesus as the Kingdom of God and is associated with the personal presence of Jesus himself. So where Jesus is, there is the Kingdom of God or the age to come. This last point is very important. Jesus has come and he has brought with him the Kingdom of God or the age to come. It is here with us now. To be sure, the full experience of this age to come awaits the second return of Christ. But the reality is here with us now because the reality of Christ by way of a spirit is here with us now. We are even now the children of the kingdom, the recipients of the age to come, since we are in Christ and possess his life, the life of the age to come. But what about this present age of sin in which we live? Isn't it also with us now? Yes, indeed it is. And it will be until Christ returns and does away with this present evil age forever. So Christians are people who live simultaneously in two ages. This present age and the age to come are both present realities for us, a dual experience for us. In this life we can never escape the tension of living at the same time in these two ages. Perhaps a diagram would help explain this reality with the Christian shown, shown as the one in the box. This shows the, the Christian living simultaneously with the ever-present reality or tension of two ages. 
So just looking at that diagram a little closer, you see this present evil age is invaded by Christ's first coming. Christ comes down into our timeline and he brings with him the age to come. Uh, in the New Testament, the age to come is also called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. It's called eternal life. Um, it's called the abundant life. There's different gospel writers have different terms they use for that age to come that's been introduced by Christ. And yet, uh, so for us, the age to come has come, but the present evil age continues until Christ's second coming, when this present evil age comes to an end, and we are just left with the full experience of the age to come. Now this is a tension that we can't escape, the side of Christ's second coming. We are always within this tension. We always find ourselves both in this present evil age and in the age to come. So for instance, in uh, Colossians chapter 3, Paul can say that you have been raised with Christ to the heavenlies. Verse 5, therefore do not set your mind on things below. You see, we're in that tension all the time. Now this explains why Christians struggle. Because sometimes when someone comes to you with a counseling issue, it's because the reality of this present evil age has overwhelmed them as to the reality of their of their age to come or their eternal life um, significance. They are part of the age to come and all the blessings that came with Christ and the kingdom of God are theirs and yet the reality of this present evil age has overwhelmed them momentarily so they've lost sight of that age to come blessing and now they're looking to you for help. They're looking to you to encourage them and bless them and move them back into a reality of age to come blessing that is theirs now. Now, see, it's not a matter of we are in this present evil age and the age to come will not come for us until Christ returns. So all we can do now is just tie a knot in the end of our rope and grit our teeth and hang on until Jesus comes back. Rather, that age to come blessing is already ours. So pastoral counselling is putting Christians in connection with age to come blessing, which is ours now in Christ. But because that tension is always there, Christians will always experience a level of struggle. Hence in pastoral care, you see our, our ministry always has to be with the reality of both. And we've looked, for instance, on this question of old age, and, and the scriptures are very real, realistic about what old age is like in terms of this present evil age. And we've also seen the scriptures are very realistic about what old age is like in terms of the age to come. And there's both sides to that. Well, how we can view old age. Well, there's both sides to how we can view every aspect of the Christian life. And so in our ministry, we are, we are, are not minimizing or glossing over the reality of pain in this present evil age, but also we're bringing with power and passion, compassion and grace, the reality of the age to come, and pressing that down into the hearts of believers who struggle and suffer. This is why so often we find ourselves one moment feeling elated over our relationship with Christ and the blessings of grace and forgiveness, and in the next moment, so it seems, depressed and discouraged over the misery of living in a, in a fallen world. Both experiences are valid because each belongs respectively to the two ages in which we live. So here you are, you have, you, you have your quiet time in the morning, and in that quiet time, you are experiencing the blessings of being part of that age to come. And then uh, before you leave the house, your spouse says something that uh, something unkind. And, and as you leave the house, you're plunged into the reality of this present evil age and you find yourself struggling in your heart with resentment. Or you might get in your car and you're driving to work and suddenly a car uh, uh, cuts in front of you and it's all you can do not to uh, say a naughty word about that driver and, and suddenly you find yourself saying, what's wrong with me? Half an hour ago I was enjoying sweet fellowship with the Lord and now my heart is just full of anger and rage. You see, have I lost my salvation? Am I not really a Christian? See, these are the kind of questions that Christians ask themselves to deal with those realities. But the fact is that you are experiencing the reality of these two ages within half an hour of your, of your life. You experience the blessings of the age to come, you experience the reality of struggle with this present evil age. For Paul, the gospel delivers us from this present evil age or dominion of darkness and places us even now in a new age, the age to come. The blessings of this new future age are for us now a present reality as well as a future promise. They're both a present reality and a future promise. 
the age to come was already here and the present power of the Holy Spirit was not yet here in the full glory of the returning Christ. But this present evil age also remains a present reality. In the first coming of Jesus Christ, this evil age was put on notice. At the return of Christ, this present evil age will come to an end. In the meantime, it's still here and we still participate in it. In our present situation, then we have to contend with these two realities. We are part of this world or age that is passing away, while at the same time we are participating in the eternal reality of the age or world to come. These two realities are simultaneous for us. We experience new life in Christ and at the same time we struggle with this present evil age. The attention we experience by living in the overlap of these two ages will be with us until we die and until Jesus Christ returns. There is no escaping the, atten the tension in this life. So in your counselling you cannot hold out the false hope that they can escape this tension in this life. You cannot hold out the false hope that if you do this and this and this and this you'll never have to struggle with this and this and this again. The tension will always be there. What you hold out to them is the promise that in the midst of that struggle with the present evil age, you have the presence and the promises of Christ to connect you with, with age to come blessing in the midst of the struggle. This is the framework of Paul's theology as developed by him in continuity with what Jesus taught in the Gospels. Now we can bring this understanding to the two texts in question. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone in Christ is a new creation, behold, the old is past and the new has come. In this verse, Paul is speaking of the present here and now reality for the Christian of the new age, the age that is to come. So old in this verse refers to this present evil age. It does not refer to our personal past histories and experiences. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is past, the new has come. Now, what is the old there and what is the new there? Now, the person that, asks, that makes the protest, why are you asking me questions about my past, is doing so on the assumption that, that new and old are referring to personal experiences of life before Christ and after Christ, or as a non-Christian and as a Christian. Personal life experience. What we've seen here that when Paul talks about new and old, he's talking about the new age that has come in the old age of this present evil age. So the old in this verse refers to this present evil age. It does not refer to our personal past histories and experiences, but rather to the old world order, this present evil age that is presently passing away. Likewise, new here does not speak primarily of personal Christian living, but to the new age, the eternal age of bliss, which those in Christ have already been placed and been made a part. So this verse describes our standing with respect to the two ages, rather than to our personal history before and after conversion. In other words, that verse describes the man in the box in that diagram. 2 Corinthians 5.17 describes that diagram and where you are in that diagram. Uh, the New English Bible puts it rather well. When anyone is united to Christ, there is a new world. The old order has gone and a new order has already begun. So 2 Corinthians 5.17 does not require us to deny the present reality of past or pre-conversion experiences that continue to entangle and distract us from enjoying age to come blessing. See, if, if the present evil age is still a reality for us, then the present evil age is still going to be mitigating, fighting against our experience of age to come blessing. Now, you see, when, when God looks at our life, he doesn't see our life in terms of past, present, and future. He, he is the Alpha and the Omega. For God, everything is an eternal present. When he looks at our life, he sees exactly that, our life. Our life as we struggle with present uh, evil age reality and age to come blessing. When we look at our life, we look at our life in terms of past, present, and future. We look at our life in the terms of this, don't we? When we look at our lives. And, and we plan our lives, say, a week ahead, like a week from now, you've got some reading to do, and a week after that, you've got an exam to sit. And that's about as far as we can go, any more than that, and we just, our minds can't contain it. It's just all too much. And so we have these little increments, well, just, just let me get, get through this, and then I can move on. And when Christ looks at our life, he sees the whole thing from where to go. He sees how all of our pasts is affecting all of our present. 
and will affect all of our future. He sees it all as an eternal present. So when you're counseling somebody, when you ask them questions about the past, about the past, you are encouraging them to have the same perspective on their life that God has on their life. God sees all of it. He sees their life. And their life is made up of present evil age, pressing in, impacting on, fighting against, age to come blessing. So, what, in what ways has the present evil age impacted on your life back here that is working against your experience of new age blessing here? The truth will set you free. When we understand that, then we can work against the effect of that New Age curse. So 2 Corinthians 5.17 does not require us to deny the present reality of past or pre-conversion experience, experiences that continue to entangle and distract us from joy and age to come blessing. That's a pretty key sentence if you're doing any highlighting here. This verse does not make our questions about our past histories illegitimate, nor does this verse negate the ongoing tension of struggling with the influence of this present evil age upon us as believers. This verse is not speaking to our personal histories, rather it is speaking to our new position in Christ, our placement into the age to come, the kingdom age that is already here but not yet here in its fullness. We are no longer held captive by this present evil age, but we do continue to struggle and suffer as we live in a world that is no longer our home. What about Philippians 3.13? I'll just read that out again to you. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize which Christ has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In this verse, what does Paul mean by the phrase, forgetting what lies behind? The answer is to be found in the verses earlier in this chapter. In verse 7, he repeats the same idea. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is behind him that he now what is behind him that he now wants to forget and forsake? Sorry. I'll say that again. What is behind him that he now wants to forget and forsake are the things of verses five and six. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Those are the things that he wants to put behind him. Now, why does he want to put those things behind him? Because he was trusting those things for his salvation. That's why he wants to be rid of them, because he was trusting them for salvation. He wants to forget and forsake the things of verses 5 and 6, the things in his life he used to exalt and trust in for God's favor. What is behind and must now be forgotten is his past reliance on good works and exemplary traditions. These things are now a liability to his newfound faith in Christ, and must be put aside. Paul must now press on away from those things that would call him back from a life of faith and reliance on gospel promise and new life in Christ. Verses 13 and 14. Brothers, I do not consider myself to take hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. These verses show that for Paul the struggle was ongoing. This is the, the two-age tension of life in that box. For Paul was ongoing. He was very aware in his personal experience of the tension between forsaking the things of this present evil age, the things of verses 5 and 6, and pursuing Christ, pursuing the new life of the age to come. Verse 15. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. In verse 15, Paul calls mature those who, like him, understand this tension and who don't deny the struggle and who reflect productively on their past as he did. For these mature ones, the Christian life consists of fear and trembling. Uh, chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but how much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why do we work out our salvation with fear? Why is it with fear and trembling? Why isn't it with, uh, with joy and rejoicing? Why is it with fear and trembling? Because 
See, there's the box. We work out our salvation. I used to come blessing with fear and trembling because we're still caught up in this present evil age. <clears throat> For these mature ones, the Christian life consists of fear and trembling. So, the one who works out their salvation with fear and trembling is the mature Christian. Uh, three... 15. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. The mature Christian, with fear and trembling, works out his salvation as they face life in a fallen world, seeking to know more of the power of Christ, more of age to come blessing. So forgetting what lies behind is not a phrase that renders legitimate any questions that cast light on the ongoing struggle to live by faith as Christians in a non-Christian world. Rather, we must forget, forsake those past things which we have relied on or worshipped as a means of making this present evil age bearable. In conclusion, a spiritual counsellor or encourager should see the Christian they are talking to as one who lives between two worlds, in the overlap of two ages, one earthly and one heavenly. The ongoing tension of this overlap gives rise to the present struggle, the presenting problem, and provides a way forward in our inquiries. We ask questions of the past and present history of personal experiences because we take seriously the struggle and pain of living all our lives as children and as adults in this present evil age. Our past is still with us to the extent that this present evil age is still with us. Our past is still with us to the extent that this present evil age is still with us. Insights gained by such gentle and sensitive questioning may point the inquirer to unconsidered aspects of their life and thinking, past and present, that contribute to their difficulties and struggles. The New Testament writers nowhere encourage us to live as if the blessings of heaven were here now in all their fullness and thus deny the ongoing reality of struggle in this life. The life of victory is a myth. There is no life of victory. The only one who's lived the life of victory is Jesus. We will experience his victory when he returns. So in your pastoral counselling, you are not seeking to bring the inquirer to experience a life of victory. You are encouraging and bringing them to a full realisation of the two-age reality, that they might put their hope in Christ while the struggle remains. You see, the reason they come to you for counselling is, is they want you to make the present evil age go away, to fix the problem, change the circumstance. Change the situation. Make the present evil age go away so my life can be more whatever they want. You can't do that. Only Jesus can do that and he won't do it till he comes back. But what you can do is give them a renewed sense of what Christ has for them in the midst of their struggle. So while their circumstance and their situation may never change, everything changes for them because now they struggle with an age to come reality rather than struggling, overwhelmed with this present evil age. The New Testament writers nowhere encourage us to live as if the blessings of heaven were here now in all their fullness and thus deny the ongoing reality of struggle in this, in this life. This would only encourage arrogant triumphalism that denies or at best provides superficial remedies for the present pain and suffering. Nor do the New Testament writers encourage us to live as if heaven's blessings were all future and all we can do now is grit our teeth and hope we can make it till Jesus comes back. This would tend towards despair and hopelessness. You see, if, if you just live up here and deny the reality of this, it leads to, leads to arrogance and triumphalism, pharisaicalism. If you live down here without any hope of race to come blessing, it's nothing but despair and misery. And all your hope is future. There's no present hope to be enjoyed. The focus is rather on both struggle and joy as dual or present day realities. We must help each other bear with our struggles, whether they are sourced in our past or present histories, and at the same time offer one another tastes of the life of Christ, knowing with certainty that the full reality of heaven's joy awaits us. Why are you asking me questions about my past? Because your past and present experience of life in this present evil age may be getting in the way of your experiencing the present day blessings of the age to come. Okay, any thoughts or comments about that? What I've said there. Yeah, 
Yeah, you kind of covered it a bit later, but um, when, was, when Paul says I'm looking straight to him, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider lost. And that already is counselling, but he's counselled himself. Gone back and looked at what worked or what held him back, you know, what, how he was lying to himself or whatever. He's taken a backward look. Yeah, well, he had to do that to know what to get rid of. So he's gone back, yes. Your argument kind of doesn't work in some way. My argument? No, no, their one, saying you can't. Oh, right. Paul said yes. to do that, but to say that, he had to go and do it. Yes, he did. <coughs> had to take an inside look or a backward look, yes. I certainly think the further you go along in life, those things, if you repair, damage or leave old things behind, then they're not affecting you as much as you go on. So you won't have to look back again. But certainly at some point you have to start understanding how sin is yeah, affecting you right now, your faith. This is really helpful because I do know quite a few people who mm. feel that way about counselling, but it's living in the past or digging up all this old stuff that doesn't shouldn't mm. be of any concern. Mm -hmm. All the psychoanalyzing. The funny thing is, though, they, then there is some of them like that. What? Don't have a lot to work with if, if they won't do that, because the only thing they seem to be left with then is trying harder, like to obey what Paul, you know, don't do this, don't do that, live lives like this. And it's so they want, they want your advice. They want your advice on how to, on how to live a better life, how they can try harder and do better. Mm. Tell me how to do that, and you want to ask them about mm. their past relationships. And they get a bit twitchy about that. Yeah. yeah. I think some of it is that the culture of, of the church today, like you mentioned it in the introduction of pastoral counselling, when covering topics like death, where where. Um, people very quick to say I oh, don't worry about it, just hope in, hope in that place you, you'll be without any death, without any suffering and um, without actually first uh, um, honestly looking at how that loss is actually affecting that person now so mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I guess with, as well as death that, that struggle there's a, there's a, um, that reality uh, of the current evil age would include sickness and abuse and all sorts of uh, loss and, and suffering. And again, it's, it's, we do have that beautiful hope that we can give people, but it's first giving them that, re that, that, uh, that truth and that honesty to be able to... Um, to see how they're being affected now, how their heart is being uh, affected now by those things, and, and, and then being able to then um, encourage them. Mm -hmm. Can you think of an example? What, beyond sort of just. Uh, just, it's interesting seeing people's reactions to, to funerals, and, and even even in sermons in the, in the funeral. Often people, I mean, it is a wonderful thing when a Christian does die, but often Christians forget that it's it's a really sad loss to to have a, a friend and loved one not with you anymore. And so it's it's a, it's, it's, it's a do with balance. It's the current culture is not really focusing on that, that loss and that lament. It's, um, okay. it's a high focus on that, that, that future hope. So, so this you might have a, an 18 year old girl grieving the death of her grandmother and someone comes along and says that, um, uh, you should be happy because your grandmother's no longer suffering. Mm -hmm. And yet that girl is grieving over the reality of of the present evil age, as she's witnessed the suffering 
and death of her grandmother. The four works itself out. As you say, it's a very legitimate lament. And it's not, yeah, it's not providing comfort, God's comfort to someone in the here and now when they need it. Because she's needing comfort. Because she's suffered a loss. It's not just about her grandmother's loss. She, her net loss is actually gain. But yeah, the girl actually feels that mm. it's her own loss which should be acknowledged. Yeah, not minimised. I think it's if there is that honest lament, there can then be that that flowing on from that is that dependence upon God. Mm. Whereas if you try and jump straight to that hope, um, there's kind of these feelings of emptiness and what are you trying to kind of hyper Christianly kind of mm. it's, it seems it doesn't seem to connect to your heart. That's it. very good. It's just a religious idea. Mm. It's not a life-giving truth. It's like Job, he actually struggled through the pain and not understanding what was going on, confusion. Um, and that's where suffering hasn't been... It's sort of coming back a lot now, I think, with a lot of books and that. But certainly when I was growing up, there was you know, the victorious life sort of thing. Or else, or else, if you didn't buy that one, you just bought hanging in there until... Right. Um, but the idea of that there's actually purpose in everything we suffer, and what really is the purpose, that we know God more, that like we use the suffering to... Suffering forces us the pain to change and to trust in God more, but it's kind of like... That was never really grasped hold of, like used the pain, like you said. Instead, it's kind of just, we'll just try and minimise the pain um, anyhow you can until, you know, heaven comes and So what, yeah, this, this gives us a theology of suffering mm. with which to take into this present evil age. Mm. Sees it in perspective with the age to come. I've been really encouraged with two recent converts, the Christiania ones, I read on the internet, and one I met at the thing, who gave a great testimony only months old in the faith for one of them and one less than a couple of years and they have that whole thing of suffering just down so much better than people who've been Christians for decades eh? just because of what they themselves have been through on their way to and what God asked them to do after they were converted took them straight into some pretty hard stuff Right. it was really cool I really encouraged them like, if you keep that God's sovereign and that Christ will call you to suffer for him you just keep those two things you'll stay pretty so it does see it does bear what we said earlier here where if you're aware of relationships that were broken back here have never been reconciled and here you find yourself facing the loneliness the terror really of loneliness in late adulthood and and uh, so you're asking them questions about this relationship back here say 20 years ago and they're saying well you know, what are you asking me about that for? You know, that was years ago. Nothing can be done about that. Well, that's present evil age hopelessness. Because the age to come is a present reality, there is every hope that we can give this person that with help we can actually go back and have that relationship reconciled so they can take that reconciled relationship with them into late adulthood. Okay, next week is our last lecture on old age and dying. It just gets better and better. <laughs> then we'll have the exam. Death. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, you've given us an insight from the scriptures about what's up ahead for each one of us in late adulthood. And, and uh, Lord, the desire, the longing of our heart really is that in that time of our life that our hearts could be full of joy and peace and thanksgiving in the Lord Jesus Christ so as to be a blessing to those around us. Father, we long for that and we pray that even now that you would be uh, teaching us the kind of lessons we need to know about our own life so that we can be sure that uh, 
we deal with sin and we deal with sin in relationships and so that we can take we can take people with us into late adulthood and keep those relationships warm and vibrant and life-giving. We thank you, Father, that uh, and even though the present evil age is still with us, age to come, blessings are now ours and we can apply them to every aspect of our experience of this present evil age, both past and present, we can apply these blessings to them and 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 no um, forgiveness, no reconciliation, no healing, no uh, renewed hope and joy and rejoicing in those abundant blessings that are available for us in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would give us the wisdom that we need from above to to be able to deal with these issues in our own lives and to to be of use and of service to you in the lives of others uh, in uh, in the Christian community and in the wider community, in our neighbourhoods, wherever we find people of late adulthood, that you would help us to treat them with honour and respect and dignity and and uh, be reminded of our own need to walk with you every day of our lives with repentant hearts, dealing with our sin before you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.